Thanks very much, fellow Viscardi. If I'm being recorded, I'd better be careful what I say. Um, I should just say that my dissertation had one chapter on Luigi Sturzo. Um, it, it wasn't the whole dissertation, um, so I'm, I'm not as much of an expert on him as Father Viscardi uh, perhaps is implying, uh, and as he might wish. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me stress that he's quite right. Uh, since finishing my dissertation, uh, this is an ongoing project of mine. Um, this, what I'm going to present to you tonight, is part of some ongoing research that I'm doing, um, and I do have hopes uh, for it in the long term. Um, in fact, um, Father Viscardi's uh, comments are, are, are giving me hope that when I ask for a sabbatical at some point in the future to write that book, um, I'll meet with some sympathy. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, the project is a mutual one. Uh, it's to get the Sicilians back on the map, basically. So Sturzo tonight, maybe next year Viscardi, who knows. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the uh, theology of Lu Luigi Sturzo. Uh, Christian faith and global politics. Um, and also let me just thank one or two very familiar faces in the audience, friends, fellow, fellow parishioners, uh, the director of religious education at our, at our parish, uh, students, former students, colleagues. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the trouble to come out. Um, who was Luigi Sturzo? What were his insights into global politics, and why might they be relevant today? To begin with, Sturzo was the first Catholic thinker to write extensively on global governance in the modern era of international treaties and institutions. Thus, he is a recent heir to the great tradition of Catholic internationalism that has its roots not only in the great 16th century engineers of international law, such as Francisco Suarez and Francisco de Vitoria, but also in biblical revelation itself. In addition, he is a precursor to the work of more recent Catholic thinkers, such as Jacques Maritain and John Courtney Murray who have reflected on 20th century developments in the international sphere, leading to our own so-called era of globalization. Consequently, Sturzo is a pivotal figure in the history of Catholic reflection on global affairs. But this reference to theological reflection in the international realm suggests a second major contribution to an understanding of the world and ourselves. Nothing less than a methodological recasting of the social sciences in order to account for the reality of human personality. As recalcitrant sociologist Christian Smith argues, much of the social sciences informed by positivist empiricism give us views of human persons and social life that are too simplistic. Smith maintains that certain things that are real are not visible to direct human observation that not everything real is empirical. By that he means observed. Or even actual, which he means what, by which he means what happens in the world when real capacities are activated even if we do not observe them. In other words, reality has a deep dimension often operating below the surface of empirical experience. To think otherwise is to commit the epistemic fallacy, to reduce what is to what we can empirically observe. Prescient of Smith in this regard, Sturzo aims to show the complex roots of world history and global politics and to present a social theory of them both. In this lecture then, I will present Sturzo's insights regarding global governance in order to show how his work might contribute to the current debate in the field of international relations regarding the future of global politics. 
First, I will describe Sturzo's account of international relations from a Catholic perspective with specific reference to his critique of national state sovereignty. Second, I will explore Sturzo's account of human personality as the ground upon which he conceptualizes the historical development of the international community and elaborate upon it by reference to Smith's account of the person. Finally, I will outline the current debate in international relations regarding the future of global governance with reference to a number of contemporary advocates of cosmopolitan democracy, whom I deem particularly insightful, and correlate Sturzo's position with these thinkers. So first section, Sturzo's account of international relations. Sturzo was an Italian priest, social reformer, and founder in 1919 of the Popular Party that later became the Christian Democratic Party, and a social theorist who wrote extensively about global governance during the early and middle parts of the last century. Regarding global governance, Sturzo's great contribution is his account of the formation and development of the idea of an international community. Sturzo locates the roots of this idea in the Christian revelation of human equality before God and the subsequent religious duty to love one's neighbor in a manner that transcends the traditional boundaries of the ancient world. As Sturzo puts it, no bond of kinship, race, or nation was to be respected if it drew a man away from God and infringed the rights of conscience. Of course, this good, this good news was universal. It was, quote, addressed to all peoples and all classes, Jew or Gentile, Greek or barbarian, rich or poor, master or slave. Moreover, there emerged the constitution of the church, which was deemed extraneous to political or domestic institutions, autonomous and independent, founded on definite beliefs reputed as truths, indeed as truth itself. Thus, the social values of the pre-Christian world are inverted, and human personality as such assumes the mantle previously held by the social and ethnic bonds of that era. Now, admittedly, the notion of a Christian international society is at marked variance with the facts of history. As Sturzo reminds us, a fundamental dualism of political and religious powers was the novelty introduced with Christianity, and this diarchy, as Sturzo calls it, has characterized every Christian civilization for 2,000 years. Indeed, one could argue it was precisely this dualism that allowed political power to dissociate itself from religious authority over the course of the centuries and claim for itself not only autonomy, but absolute autonomy over its subjects through the appropriation of its own personality. In any event, Sturzo concedes the modern state remained the central arbiter of power in the international community up to his day. But the state was not the only such power. In fact, the development of such bodies as the Permanent Arbitration Court, the Permanent Court of International Justice, the Pan-American Union, the British Commonwealth, and the League of Nations, reflected the evolution of a relatively new state of affairs that Sturzo describes as the interdependence of states. This development was premised for Sturzo on the fundamental law of individuality sociality that underlies all human society. 
The more individuals increase in conscious personality, the fuller the development of their associative qualities and forces. The fuller the development of such associative forces, the more the individuals develop and deepen the elements of their personality. Thus, society crystallizes itself through a continuous process of action and reaction into a number of individual bodies, while at the same time the individual is socialized through the development of these same bodies. This variety leads Sturzo to claim it is simply not true that political power has to be concentrated in a single organism, or that such an organism has to be the state. This vision does not mean that Sturzo thinks there should be no role afforded to states in the international realm. To the contrary, he states clearly that the state gains in stability to the extent that its power relies less on force than on law. Indeed, the achievement of, quote, conscious personality on the part of the various states is a key factor for Sturzo in the progress of the international community towards its own organization and self-consciousness. But this very progress suggests that modern states are responding through the enactment of treaties and conventions to a reality beyond themselves. This reality, moreover, amounts to an unwritten law or moral force that is oriented towards the protection of individual persons and which becomes the objective rule of social life in the form of international law. The key point here is that Sturzo discerns not only a tendency that underlies the development of the international community, but also a normative thread that runs throughout the heart of human history. In short, states are, and should be, deferring in a progressive manner to the basic datum of human personality, understood as both individual and social in light of its eternally evolving relations. Part 2, Sturzo's account of human personality. Regarding this basic datum of human personality, Sturzo writes, the basis of society is simply the human individual taken in his concreteness and complexity as original and irresolvable principle. Society is not an entity or an organism outside and above the individual nor is the individual a reality outside and above society. Man is at once individual and social. His individuality, sorry, his individual potentiality and social potentiality have a single root in his sensitive, rational nature. He is so individual as not to partake of any life but his own, as to be incommunicable personality. He is so social that he could not exist nor develop any faculties, nor even live his life outside the social forms. End of quote. Thus, in Sturzo's view, it is evident that in the concrete we find neither individuals apart from society, nor society apart from individuals. In the concrete, there are only individuals in society. The associative principle in the individual is an inner principle, he writes, while it completes his individual reality. There does not exist an extra individual, and hence extra human, associative principle, subsistent and as such informing social life. Sturzo concedes 
that it is difficult for people to envisage the passage from the individual to the social without any outside element to which society might owe its realization and characterization. Consequently, they speak of social ends as objective and self-subsistent. Sturzo does not deny the existence of social ends, but he does not consider them as external to the individual. They are rather inherent in human nature itself, and only, the, and only by the individual can they be realized, and in fact are realized. The finalistic element, as Sturzo calls the end of both the individual and society, is nothing other than the very nature of the subject considered as a tendency or exigency to seek fulfillment and perfection. By that he doesn't mean moral perfection so much as completeness in the Aristotelian sense. The subject, moreover, is nothing other than the individual man who in himself and of himself requires the social forms and achieves them by his own virtue. The social ends are merely the inner ends of his activity. Sturzo claims that his account gives to the associative instinct its full value as an ever-developing exigency and social impulse. And by this very fact, he resolves the individual into society. As he puts it, the associative instinct is the same as the natural and primordial craving of the individual for completeness of life, sense and mind. A life, therefore, that is communicative in the widest and richest sense of the word. It enfolds itself in all possible ways, linguistic, sexual, paternal and maternal, religious, artistic, gregarious, altruistic, the instinct of friendship, the instinct for domination, and so on. It might be said that society develops and modifies such instincts. <clears throat> this is partly true in the sense that men cannot exist and operate save in associative form, Sturzo writes. But it does not and cannot exclude that society is originally the outcome of the activity of individuals and is implicit and potential in each one of them. From the individual, who Sturzo repeats is the whole of human nature in the concrete, proceeds also the ethico-organic element, which specifically constitutes society whether as its end, which is the same as the end of the individual, carried on to the associative plane, or as the coordination of the various activities which themselves constitute the social forms, principally the family, the political, the religious, the economy in all its guises, and the international community. Incidentally, when I'm using the word end here, this is the Thomistic sense of one's final purpose or telos, the goal of everything, the goal of life. The structure, development and duration of the social forms depend on the correspondence between their ends and the natural exigencies of individuals, Sturzo argues, and on the soundness and continuity of the cooperation of individuals in their concrete reality. Thus, society is a kind of multiple, simultaneous and continuative projection of individuals in their activity. In effect, sociology becomes a true social anthropology. I did warn you, he's a social theorist, all right? Here, Sturzo calls to mind not only traditional Catholic teaching on the human person's social nature, given the creation of the person in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God, but also Smith's revisionist critique of the social sciences in light of the nature of the human person. 
For Smith, a series of real, distinct, interrelated, causal capacities are emergent from the human body, particularly from the human brain, as it operates in its material and social environment. These causal capacities, Smith lists 30 of them, starting with subconscious being and ending with interpersonal communion and love, are the stuff out of which human personhood exists emergently. Thus, he writes, a normal person is a conscious, reflexive, embodied, self-transcending center of subjective experience, durable identity, moral commitment, and social communication, who, as the efficient cause of his or her own responsible interactions, exercises complex capacities for agency and intersubjectivity in order to develop and sustain his or her own incommunicable self in loving relationships with other personal selves and with the non-personal world. End of quote. Smith admits this definition is a mouthful, <laughs> but he uses it to launch a critique of the dominant methodology in the social sciences since World War II, namely statistical analysis of relationships among quantitatively measured variables. In Smith's view, quote, the issue with variables social science is its fragmentation of persons and human social life into the discrete factors of abstract variables. Persons are not treated as actor units, but are sliced and diced through measurement items into a variety of bits and pieces of information that are arrayed in the cells of relational databases. What remains whole and coherent in the process are not persons, but variables, which comprise data points across a wide range of values for every case in the file. Persons disappear from view. End of quote. In short, we witness a form of reductionism at work, one that epistemologically privileges the quantifiable. Having critiqued variables sociology, Smith examines the new paradigm of network structuralism that shifted attention away from individual attributes in order to focus on the overall structure of social relations in networked systems of interaction. Here, acting individuals are seen as the products of the social structure of network relations, which seems almost the exact opposite of Sturzo's position. Remember, for Sturzo, society comes out of the individual, of the person. In network structuralism, you have individuals seen as the product of social structures. In tandem with Sturzo, Smith suggests that social structures are real entities of a particular kind, and that possessing a thick notion of persons is essential for rightly understanding what social structures are, why and how they come to exist, and change. Human social life, Smith argues, is the magma that erupts and builds up, so to speak, at the fault lines where natural human capacities meet and grind against and over natural human limitations. As he puts it, human persons are endowed with immense causal powers to make and remake themselves, their relationships, their cultures, 
and the material world. But all such human powers operate within the confines of natural human limits on human bodies, consciousness and action. This meeting of powers and limitations produces a creative dynamic tension and energy that generates and fuels the making of human social life and social structures. End of quote. In a sentence wonderfully evocative of Sturzer, and remember, Smith is writing today. He's a very distinguished sociologist of religion at Notre Dame. Sturzer is writing, of course, 50 or 60 years ago. So the confluence between these two, I think, is, is fascinating. In a sentence wonderfully evocative of Sturzer, Smith then declares, society and history are thus rooted in the natural character of the human, specifically in the capacities and incapacities of persons. To understand society, therefore, we must be cognizant not only of human capacities, but also of the limitations and natural finitude of persons. How then do social structures emerge from the conglomeration of human capacities and limitations? Essentially, Smith writes, human capacities propel persons into world-engaging activities of bodily action, subjective experience, moral evaluation, material fabrication, and social interaction. People quickly hit their many limitations, and as a result, they develop solutions, tools, practices, procedures, and systems that nurture their capacities given the facts of their natural limitations. In other words, it is the natural drive towards a sustained and thriving personal life, broadly, rather than, say, the motivation for material advantage or relational dominance, when confronted with our natural limitations that generates social structures out of human existence. Smith immediately cites the example of the family, which coincidentally is Sturzo's first form of society. Note in particular Smith's reference to the activity of moral evaluation. As he points out, social structures are motivated in part by normative and moral valuations and guides. For good social structures help to facilitate the flourishing of human persons, whereas bad ones serve to undermine it. But how do structures manage to help persons, or not help them, in this way? Smith contends, quote, Personhood is not simply constituted by the upwardly moving human physiological facts and causal capacities that exist at lower levels. It is also developed through downward causation by the real level of the humanly social that exists at a higher level of stratified reality than do persons. End of quote. In light of this so-called social ontology of species solidarity, Smith deepens our understanding of Sturzo's fundamental law of individuality sociality that underlies all human society. More than this, he leaves us with a sociology conceived akin to Sturzo, not as an objective science of society, but as, quote, an essential contributor to the larger shared moral and political project of pursuing the telic social good of institutionally and structurally promoting human dignity. 
So he redefines, revises the whole academic discipline of sociology, what its goal, what its purpose is. It's very interesting, actually, incidentally, that Smith is, a, is an adult convert to Catholicism. Um, so he shares a lot of these commitments to Catholic social teaching as a professional social scientist. And I think this comes out in his writing. For his part, Sturzo writes, we are going toward an international life in spite of our mistakes and failings. If you haven't, you know, if you're having misgivings about this. Uh, thus, it appears he envisages a natural progression of individuals toward an inevitably globalized single society. Quote, this multiple simultaneous and continuative projection of individuals, which is society, he maintains, achieves itself in time, just as all individual activity is achieved through time. Human reality is process. End of quote. But note here the reference not to progress, but instead to process. We say process, that is succession, and not progress, nor evolution, Sturzo writes, because all human activity is individual, even if developing as it does, collectively or by groups. Every individual activity is, above all, experience, experiment, the reduction of the experience of others into our own, really personal. For Sturzo, then, in associative life, there are contemporaneously developments, arrest, renewals, involutions, all the stages that experience implies. Hence, there is not always progress, never a real regression, but in a relative sense, both progress and regression. That is, experimentation and achievement. So there's hope yet for us. In Sturzo's view, the ideas of progress and evolution presuppose a deterministic conception of history which denies the idea of individuality and of personal experience, and hence the idea of liberty, reducing the whole of human activity to a more or less unconscious necessity. Yet he writes, the concept of process as the succession of individual experiences and also through individuals of collective experiences, in no wise means that the individual is wholly free, without laws and without limits. It means merely that within the laws and limits of his being and of the conditioning factors about him, he is not determined, but self-determining. And by this very fact, may be considered a creator of his own experience. Incidentally, Smith likewise describes persons as proactively emergent realities. Thus, he locates human dignity at the level of personhood as such, rather than in any of the human capacities from which it emerges. This is one of the issues when we discuss the nature of human dignity. Where does it reside? Is it in our rationality, in our freedom, in our agency? What capacity is it that we have that gives us dignity? Well, if that's the case, as Smith points out, somebody who's been involved in a car accident, is in a coma, or maybe a little baby who can't rationalize yet, wouldn't have human dignity, which is problematical. And for this reason, Smith locates dignity in human personhood as such, and he roots that in this idea of our proactive. We are the agents of our own emergent reality. Right? History which Sturzo defines as the systematic and rational exposition of known events, is always incomplete. 
first in his words because what we know of the past is never the whole past but a part that which has been historicized and this never accurately and never completely so that critical revision is continuous and necessary Second, because the rational exposition through which known events are interpreted and systematized varies with different epochs, cultures, and philosophical systems. The historical datum, even if expressed by a single individual, Sturzo maintains, in order to be historical, must find its repercussions in an ever-widening circle of individuals and assume a collective character. In other words, the historical datum becomes a social element inasmuch as either actually or as symbol or attribution, it represents that human experience and activity which once posited continues to be experienced by a group in its further process. In the concrete then, we do not find society, but societies. It is possible to conceive of an international society of all the peoples of the earth, Sturzo writes, but such a construction will not be a single society for all men, but a special society of states or of peoples on the specific plane of their political relationships, or else will lead to particular societies for determined purposes, cultural, economic, or otherwise. For every social form tends to individuation and autonomy, the basis for which lies in the way that groups distinguish themselves from other groups. As Sturzo puts it, the element of distinction is a negative datum, which is rendered spiritual by the unitive principle, the social consciousness. The idea of mankind, then, may arouse in us feelings of solidarity. But such feelings are not enough, in Sturzo's view, to constitute a single society. The differentiation would be lacking, which, as we have seen, is the negative moment necessary for a social unification. The dynamism would be lacking, which can be found only in a properly individuated social form. Yet, he writes, within the active totality of men, we may conceive of a web of individuated societies with ever-widening relationships so as to touch the idea of universality, of a globalized universal community, without ever wholly achieving it. For the same reason, concludes Sturzo, there is no true universal history, but only particular histories of different social groups. What are called universal histories are no more than collections of particular histories, combined together from a particular angle, which can never unify them. In short, Every history indicates the consciousness of a group in the concrete. Final section, part three. Sturzo and the Cosmopolitan Democrats. You know what? I'm going to get some water here. Getting a little... These commitments to morality, law, the dignity of the human person, and the distribution of political power and pluralism can be heard in a number of quarters today. Robert Cooper, the British diplomat, clearly an authority, argues that the world can now be divided into three parts, the pre-modern, the modern, and the postmodern. The pre-modern world refers to areas such as Somalia or Afghanistan that are characterized by a kind of pre-state, post-imperial chaos. The modern world, for Cooper, is the world of the nation-state, 
It is characterized by the recognition of state sovereignty, the subsequent separation of domestic and foreign affairs, and the prohibition on external interference in internal state business. In the postmodern world, Cooper argues, the state system is also collapsing. But unlike the pre-modern, it is collapsing into greater order than disorder. What he has in mind was, or what he had in mind when he was writing this, was the European Union. So you might find this position somewhat contentious. <laughs> Cooper observes that one of the most striking aspects of the postmodern world is the breakdown of the distinction between domestic and foreign affairs. Think about how money moves across you know, borders immediately, how the internet, social media, Twitter allows people in all sorts of countries around the world to instantaneously communicate with all kinds of other people. Yeah. So he says that one of the most striking aspects of our world, of our so-called postmodern world, is the breakdown, excuse me, <coughs> of the distinction between domestic and foreign affairs. So again, think globalization. The outstanding example of this breakdown is the European Union, where the management of a single market is best characterized as both domestic and foreign business. As Cooper puts it, the European Union is a highly developed system for mutual interference in each other's domestic affairs, right down to beer and sausages. Sort of resisting state sovereignty. And if you, know, if you know the English well enough, we don't like our sovereignty challenged, especially when it comes to beer and sausages. Or Scotland. Or Scotland, that's right. Another example of the breakdown of the distinction between domestic and foreign affairs is the emergence of the International Criminal Court. In this regard, he remarks, if the world is going to be governed by law rather than force, then those who break the law will be treated as criminals. So if we live in a world of international law, then if you break the law, you'll be hauled up to the ICC in The Hague. Consequently, Cooper concludes, in the postmodern world, raison d'etat, the old term reason of state, you know, that a state will act in its own self-interests, raison d'etat and the amorality of Machiavelli have been replaced by a moral consciousness that applies to international relations as well as to domestic affairs. So it's the crucial change in, in our era. In this light, political scientist Alan Buchanan has attempted recently to ground international law on justice as opposed to the consent of states. In a similar vein, political theorists of cosmopolitan democracy, such as Thomas Pogge, David Held, and Daniel Archibugi, have called for different levels or dimensions of global governance. In Archibugi's case, local, state, interstate, regional, and global in order to enhance democracy as a form of management of global affairs that serves the interests, note, of all persons. And that comes specifically from Thomas Pogge. Archibugi not only cites empirical data in support of the benefits of democracy, advantages regarding exposure of citizens to violence and conflict, protection of their rights, their risk of famine and economic indicators, but also argues that democracy needs to be enhanced at the interstate level in order to enhance its effects at the state level, rather than the other way round, as is commonly thought, on the grounds that democratic states have too often failed to translate their internal ideals into external behavior. 
dare I say that the United States would be a perfect example of that. Um, one could say that the man on the street in the Middle East does not hate American freedom. He loves American freedom. He wants civil and political rights, if not social and economic rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. He just wants America to help him get them rather than prop up his tyrannical regime because we want cheap oil. So it's not that they hate American freedom, it's they hate, I think, our hypocrisy a lot of the time in our foreign policy. Now, Condoleezza Rice, of course, amongst others, tried to change that 15 or so years ago. So this has been a debate within the American foreign policy circles. But um, that's, I think, a very, very significant issue. Thus, the moral, moral centrality of the human person that we find in Sturzo reappears as the foundation for the commitments of these contemporary thinkers. I remember when I was writing my dissertation, talking to some friends in the political science theory at Boston College, and they were all into these really hot, sexy political theorists, you know, Daniel Archibuji and Thomas Pogge and David Held, and I was really enjoying reading their work as well. But after a while, I remember saying to one friend, yeah, but Sturzo was saying this 70 years ago. Who? Sturzo! Haven't you heard of Luigi? No, who? No, no, of course not. He's a theologian. Why would a social scientist or political scientist read a theologian, right? Anyway, that's why we're here tonight. <laughs> it is also noteworthy that Pope Benedict XVI has written of the, quote, urgent need of a true world political authority in his encyclical Caritas in Veritate, number 67. Judging from the context of his comment, the Pope does not have in mind any putative world state. In fact, he resembles one or other of the cosmopolitan Democrats in stressing that such a body should be regulated by law, observe consistently the principles of subsidiarity. In other words, it should help. The word subsidium in Latin literally means help. So this concept in Catholic teaching means that a centralized body should help more localized bodies and communities address problems at the most immediate level. It's only if they can't do it that that necessity devolves onto the higher authority, as it were. But he resembles one or other of the cosmopolitan Democrats in stressing that such a body should be regulated by law, observe consistently the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity, and obey the dictates of the common good. But the Pope's comment also resembles Sturzo, since the latter likewise advocates a genuinely international authority. Sturzo, then, is the first Catholic thinker to write on global governance in the modern era of treaties and institutions. He advances a tradition that is developed by Jacques Maritain and John Courtney Murray prior to Pope Benedict, and we would do very well to reappropriate his thought today. Thank you. Bring this sort of to uh, more specific, concrete issues. From the point of view of Christian faith, so the theological point of view, Christian faith, what would uh, the approach of Sturzo say about, say, the relationship between uh, the United Nations and the national states, United States, Mexico, Canada, England, UK? Uh, how would his vision from the point of view of Christian faith, uh, affect that. Go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Two things there, Chris, in response. The first thing, when you said, um, speaking a little bit more concretely, um, what occurred to me was uh, human rights. 
Uh, many of you will be familiar with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which of course came slightly after um, most of Sturzo's most important works. I mean, his Inner Laws of Society, which I'm quoting from this evening, uh, was written in 1944. Uh, his book on nationalism and internationalism, uh, I think, was around the same time. Um, and so, you know, he was writing before, the, certainly before the development of what we call the human rights regime in the world today. But I think that a Catholic position on this, um, and the Catholic Church, of course, commits itself to the human rights tradition in 1963 in the papal document Parchum in Terris. That's where the Church really um, commits itself to modern human rights. And the Catholic position, in a nutshell, is the human person is created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we have dignity as persons. Therefore, we have human rights. And the Catholic Church is committed not only to what we call in the tradition civil and political rights, rights to free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, but also what are sometimes called the second generation rights of empowerment, social and economic rights, rights to health care, rights to education, to shelter, etc. Um, these are norms, I hasten to add. Church is not teaching that any society has to institute a particular healthcare system, for example, but it is claiming that if we have the resources to do so, then we must, uh, as a moral imperative. Um, we must, you know, we must build a universal healthcare system in our own way. Um, I think Sturzo would be very committed to the idea of human rights coming out of his idea of the person, and this actually is, to use a phrase from Murray, the growing end of Sturzo that I want to develop in, in a longer, much longer piece, will be rights. Coming out of Sturzo, coming out of this commitment to the person, as a Catholic, working in the tradition of Catholic social teaching, where we go from a person in the concrete is human rights. And that brings us, of course, today one could say, what are the signs of the times today? Well, refugee rights, let's say, all right? So I think Sturzo, it could well be said, speaking very concretely, very specifically, would be calling us to engage with the rights of migrants, the rights of displaced persons, all right? Um, David Hollenbach, my dissertation director, his last two books have been books on refugee rights. So this is a very significant topic in the Catholic tradition. Um, Jesuit refugee service would be part of this, all right? So concretely speaking, that would be, uh, that is something that um, occurs to me. The other thing, when you talk about nations and the international order, right? Um, Sturzo is part of what I call a troika, uh, Maritain and Murray. Um, Maritain and Sturzo basically both want to disown the concept of nation-state sovereignty. They think it's outlived its usefulness in a world, as I said in the paper, that is interdependent, um, that is global. Um, and Murray wants to retain the notion or the concept of sovereignty, but he wants to radically redefine it. John Courtney Murray, the great Jesuit, of course, who died in 1967, um, he defines sovereignty very interestingly um, that a nation is sovereign when it serves the family of nations of which it is a part, uh, when it builds the common good of the international community. That is how he defines sovereignty. And there's an article in the very recent edition of Foreign Affairs called Sovereign Obligation. And it's all about how in our context of globalization and interdependence, what we need with regards to the concept of sovereignty is a sense of sovereign obligation to others. The word, the concept sovereignty, as I'm sure most of you are familiar, um, you know, emerged in the modern era um, 
it didn't, it wasn't caused by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, but after Westphalia, the treaty that uh, ended the Thirty Years' War in Europe, this notion of state sovereignty really uh, becomes the key ingredient of the international sovereign state system, right? Uh, and so for 400 years or so, you have this uh, sovereign state system where we don't invade other people's territory. The definition of sovereignty, um, I'm citing Daniel Philpott, who's a political theorist at uh, Notre Dame, wrote a very good book on sovereignty, revolutions and sovereignty, and he defines it as um, complete supreme authority within a territory. Supreme authority within a territory, right? And of course, after the religious wars, this was a wonderful way of building some degree of peace in the world. Supreme authority within a territory. So if I'm the Catholic king of Bavaria, my people are Catholic, thank you very much. And if Sam is the Protestant prince of Prussia, he and I have agreed at Westphalia, he's not going to invade my Catholic territory, I'm not going to invade his Protestant territory, right? He thinks all of my folk are going to hell in a basket, in a handbasket. I think all of his people are going to hell in a handbasket. But at least we're not going to kill one another over that difference of opinion. All right. Um, and of course, it preserved some peace in Europe, right, and in the world. Now, and that's right. And now, think about this: supreme authority within a territory. What does that mean in a globalized world? What does that mean in a globalized world? What sort of authority does Hosni Mubarak have in Egypt when Tunisian student bloggers are in contact with revolutionaries in Egypt during the Arab Spring? And people are, they know the technology. I mean, I don't, but these guys who are 18 and 20 do. And they can get round any of the state inhibitions on the internet, right? Um, what does supreme authority over a territory mean in the age of the internet, in the age of globalization? It certainly doesn't mean the same as what it meant 400 years ago. Sturzer was onto this in the 1940s, right? as was Murray, as was Maritain. Now, of course, in the debates in political science, if you go to political science conferences and talk about sovereignty, you know, we're talking about the cosmopolitan Democrats. And as I said before, if I mentioned Sturzo, if I mentioned Maritain, some people probably have heard of him, but people just don't know Sturzo or Maritain, right? Because of the marginalization of theology academically for so long. Um, we are blessed, I think, today with a resurgence of religion globally, domestically. Um, it's a wonderful book, um, God Centric, uh, by Timothy Shah, Daniel Philpott, um, and what's the other author, Jackson? You've read it. Timothy Shah, Monica Toft, that's right, three authors, Monica Toft, Daniel Philpott, and Timothy Shah. And wonderful book, could not recommend it more highly, God Centric. Um, and they're talking about the resurgence of religion in our era. Um, I won't go into all the details, but um, you know, two theses. One, they have the empirical data, as we all you know, look at the world. Um, and secondly, the key question for them is how will this resurgence of religion play out in the international community? Will it be a force for good, or will it be a force for bad? And I often say to my students, you know, the most important question of your lifetime is what makes this committed religious person become a terrorist and spend his life trying to blow up innocent men, women, and children in marketplaces or on airplanes. And this similarly religious person, belonging to the same religion with ostensibly the same God, spend his life as a peacemaker committed to reconciliation and building peace. What is it? Sociologically, psychologically, economically, politically, that makes one person go one way and one person go the other. Because the answer to those questions affect us all very, very deeply. 
in an interdependent global as well. So the world we live in today is a very different world from 400 years ago. And Sturzo, talking about the interdependence of the global community, the breakdown of the sovereign state system, the, um, the uh, need to jettison the concept of sovereignty, he would be calling, I think, for the building of the global common good. He would be calling for, as I'm arguing in the paper, with the cosmopolitan Democrats um, to have a structured method of governance on various levels. It, it sounds very abstract, but once you start thinking about environmental regulations, the economy, sexual and labor trafficking, criminal activity, um, all sorts of things are very concrete and globalized, and we need good governance, good governance to run our world. And so I think Sturzo is highly concrete in his call for this interdependence of nations. Um, I think he'd be very um, taken with this recent article that I mentioned in Foreign Affairs on sovereign obligation. Um, and I read that article and I thought, this is Murray. This is what Murray said in 1944 uh, in his uh, homily on the building of the international community. So Sturzo, with Murray, with Maritain, I think are highly pertinent figures for our day and age. So short answer, human rights, and then interdependence. We live in an interdependent world. What we need is good governance. Does that help? Yeah, Jack? When discussing uh, Pope Benedict XVI, you mentioned uh, the, um, the theory of subsidiarity. Yeah. yeah. The classic definition of subsidiarity comes from Pius XI's mm -hmm. 1931 right. Quadragesimo Anno. That was precisely when Sturzo was writing. Yeah, a little bit before then. Yeah, that's right. Well, then, around then. Yeah, he's born yeah. in 1871, so he's yeah. I mean, he's middle aged by then. Right. Yeah. yeah, and he was writing in the 30s, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. So, did the principle of subsidiarity was that was did he discuss it? Did he use it? Did it mean anything to him? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure how to answer that, Jerry. Actually, just off the top of my head. Um, he certainly is not, I mean, what I can say, you know, I can't sort of cite, I can't think to cite, oh yeah, in that text he mentions it, you know. Um, we could look it up. Uh, he might, I'm not sure off the top of my head whether he specifically refers to the concept of subsidiarity. What I can say is, to more broadly speaking, he certainly, as I said in the paper, does not advocate some kind of world state. Um, he's not advocating some kind of top-down global authority, um, but as I suggest in the paper, not unlike Pope Benedict, um, he does advoca advocate the need for some kind of global authority. Now, he writes extensively on the League of Nations uh, in his book Nationalism and Internationalism, uh, which of course collapses, um, and then of course talks about the United Nations in that book, sort of just in the process of being talked about in form. Um, so he's committed to those kinds of organizations, but again, those are not, you know, despite some people's opinions in this country, are not top-down, you know, necessary or so more sort of principle would be operative in his thinking. I think so, yeah, I think so, definitely. I, I, I would have to spin it out a little bit, but given the reading that I've done in, in Stuart, so uh, I think that's there, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's certainly not advocating some sort of top-down, because his, you know, as I've been saying, his greatest value is the person. His greatest value is human personality, human personhood, as Christian Smith did. Um, and so, for Sturzo, it's the human person that is sacrosanct, and that is what makes him so... Um, similar, to my mind, to the cosmopolitan Democrats. They want these levels of governance. They recognize that we live in a globalized world and that we need democracy at the global level 
as well as at the local level, and that having democracy internationally impacts the democracy locally or at the state level, as Archie Booby is saying. But they're not advocating some sort of top-down governance. They want an international body. Archie Booby talks about a parliament, for instance. Um, then you would have regional bodies like the European Union, like the you know, Community of American States, that sort of thing, Pan-American States. Um, you'd have um, interstate or international networks, organizations, treaties, diplomatic relations at the interstate level. You then have the state level, and then you'd have the local level, local governments down here in Alabama and then Baldwin County and Mobile County and Mobile City Council. Um, so they, and this is all in the interest of democracy, and for them, uh, bottom line is the good of the human person and the rights of the human person. And that is where I find the confluence with Stuartson. So I would and will construct um, at the growing end of Sturzo um, very similar ideas to the cosmopolitan Democrats, yeah. all of which is very compatible with subsidiarity. So I guess I'm sort of coming the long way round there in answer to your question, going through making a detour through the cosmopolitan Democrats, who David Held, for instance, does, he's a British uh, cosmopolitan democrat who teaches at Durham University in England and has written extensively on these issues. He does refer to subsidiarity um, many times in his work. Um, and so my argument would be, Stuart, so yes he does. It's a relatively new concept. It's only been around, as you said, 10 or so years when he's writing. Um, and we all know how long it takes to write a book. So if the book comes out in 1944, you know, he probably started writing it much earlier. Um, but I think that if you show the confluence of Sturzo with the cosmopolitan Democrats, who are very committed to subsidiarity, then you can show, yes, yeah, Sturzo is very much in this camp, definitely. Yeah. Father Lucy, did you have a question? When you use the word uh, human person, yes. and it, uh, it didn't use the word individual. Yeah, that's very intentional. That's very intentional. Um, Catholics, um, or proponents of Catholic social teaching at least, uh, much prefer the term the human person. Or if we use the word individual, we will normally say the individual person. And I think what's going on there is that we resist a uh, concept of the individual as atomized, um, atomized, as sort of um, divorced from any social context. Um, we would be critical of an interpretation of liberal social contract theory in the liberal political tradition that you would find in people like Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau as well, that individuals in a state of nature decide, oh, it would be better to live together rather than a, what's Hobbes' term, a short, brutal, and horrible life. Let's come together, contract, and build a, a Leviathan, as Hobbes would put it, but a society together. From a Catholic point of view, the idea that you have these fully formed individual beings prior to any social contract or building of a society is absurd. We only become individuals through our social relation. Through our social relations, we are, in, you know, we are inherently social creatures. So we use that word, the person, I think, almost subconsciously or at least implicitly, to criticise anybody who is overly individualistic. Um, all right, uh, because for Catholics, the person goes. The person is inherently social. And this, of course, has a theological ground. We believe we are created in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian three, you know, relationship of three loving persons. So being very careful about using language analogously, but um, in some sense, if we're created in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God, we must be, at our core, social, relational creatures, uh, definitively. Um, and I think that's a very significant part. I think it's the most significant part, actually, of Catholic social teaching in the American context. 
Um, and you know, I remember always one of my mentors at Boston College, Kenneth Hines, he said that Catholic social teaching falls on deaf ears in the United States. Um, I've never forgotten that. And I think it's because of our individualism um, and you know, habits of the heart, Robert Bell, um, all of that. You know, we are, our religion, um, or your religion, it's not my religion, your, your religion is individual liberty, right? Um, one could have, uh, but we are so committed to individual liberty. It's almost a religion in the United States, individual liberty. And going back to the whole issue of human rights, we stress civil and political rights of immunity that in the liberal tradition give me an immune realm of liberty, freedom, from any intrusion on the part of the king or the queen or the government. Free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, right? These are civil and political rights. In the human rights tradition, there's then this move towards rights of empowerment, social and economic rights that not only reformed liberal theorists, but also the Catholic Church argue, you also need, in order to live a dignified human life in a post-industrial capitalist economy, you need the right to an education. You need the right to a job, not to be discriminated uh, when you go for a job on the basis of your race or whatever it might be. You need shelter. You have a right to health care. All of these so-called social and economic rights, which of course in Europe are almost taken for granted, and um, painting with a broad brush, obviously, but are highly contentious in the United States. Right? Um, witness healthcare debate. Um, and um, you know, I do think that the Catholic tradition um, has a very, very different understanding of the human person than the predominant understanding in our culture, which tends to be much more individualistic. So you're right, and that's very perceptive. But, um, well, earlier yeah. you were making a point about the social, and I, I just wanted to make sure, because I think normally you wouldn't be that here in person. Yeah. Right. I, I think that the I think in the Catholic tradition, there's, there's a, a beautiful balance here because we're, we're taught to build the common good, of course. Part of Catholic social teaching is to build the common good. But why do we build the common good? Um, you know, the common good is, you know, Jerry well knows it's defined, you know, the sum of those conditions that facilitate human persons to become fulfilled, basically. So we need these social conditions, we need good schools, we need access to health care, we need environmental regulations, we need security, we need a good military, right? all of those things. Um, why do we build the common good? Is it because we're Stalinists you know, and we have a five-year plan? Because it sounds like that, it sounds almost communist. Um, yeah, we've got to build this common good. Well, the only reason we're building the common good as Catholics is for the good of individuals. It's so that individuals can flourish. But individuals only flourish as social, relational creatures. We're born in the image and likeness of a relational God. We are inherently relational and social. And we will only become fulfilled and happy if we're able to participate in the goods of a society. We'll be fulfilled in our relationships with other people, in our society, right? So why do we build the common good? Well, we're building the common good, ultimately, for the sake of individual human persons. But of course, the crucial point is that it, the individual is understood as a social creature. So we don't want to leave you alone. Uh, we want to make sure you're part of the community, part of the society. So there's this beautiful tension, I think, at the heart of Catholic social teaching. It's a both act. Uh, as always, it's a commitment to the individual person and it's all our difference. And it's a commitment to the common good as well. And commitment to the common good and to the community is for the sake of each individual. Right? You won't remember this, but um, when I first came to Spring Hill, we read the mission statement of Spring Hill College with you. 
uh, because you were president at the time, uh, new faculty, this is 10 years ago, and we talked about this, I've still got my notes, I talk about it in class, but I teach the common good. I share with them the mission statement of Spring Hill College, um, and it's beautiful. The, the three final paragraphs, first is about the individual, pura personalis, treating each individual student in their difference. You know, and I say, well, if Jerry comes to see me about some problem you know, in the class, he's crazy. I know I'm going to have to treat him very differently than if, you know, than if Dawn Butler comes, because she's great. You know, she's no problem at all. But, you know, so I've got to treat individuals differently. Yeah? And that's part of our mission statement. Pure personalis. Care of the individual person. And then the penultimate little paragraph is about the community. And then the final is the both and. And it's this beautiful marriage of a commitment to the individual person in all his or her uniqueness and yet to the community as a whole as well, right? In the knowledge that each and every individual person will only become fulfilled and become everything he or she can be as a relational creature in community. That's the key point, right? But, yeah. Thank you very much. It's almost 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Get me talking about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, turn that Thank you. Thank you.